In fact, when you are asked to do planning, like strategic planning, what is the first thing that you normally do? Don't you do it this way? First, you ask, what are the felt needs? You try to identify the problem. Like you are, you are planning for a group of catechists, for your catechists. I understand you are all catechetical directors or supervisors or whatever. So, you try to identify what is the problem. Okay, then you go to the next one, the cause. What is the cause of the problem or the causes of the problem? This is the cause analysis. Because a problem will not be there unless there is a cause. Right? Now, the third one, of course, is what is the solution? And that is where you try to, to examine, you try to analyze the solution to see whether the solution that is proposed is economical, whether it's practical, whether it's doable, whether it will get you the results that you want. Correct? You just don't get any solution. Moreover, usually there are several solutions to the problem. There is not only one. If there is only one solution, then there is no uh, need to, to break your heads. You know, you just speak it. But usually there are several solutions. And you do this in a group, so you ask them, what are the solutions to this? And then finally, you do action planning. Even if you, you don't need to write this down because uh, we will print a copy of these slides, okay? We're just waiting. Uh, we had a little virus, so they could not print it on time. So action planning is actually the treatment part. This is what we also call the diagnostic model. And those who study medicine know this very well. Because if you go to, to, to the doctor, the first thing that he asks is, what are the symptoms, right? That is why they said, if you want to discover your sickness, you go to the doctor. If you don't go there, you are not sick. Okay? But actually, the doctor, whenever you go to the doctor, he will ask you, what do you feel? What are the symptoms? You know? I know there are Vietnamese here, so you can perhaps uh, translate. Who are the Vietnamese? Okay? Two of them. Anyway, you can translate perhaps. You know, there was this guy who went to the doctor and he said, Doc, I am. I don't know. May problem ako eh. Ano ba problem mo? Sa umaga, parang tumatahula ko. Parang pakiramdam ko, aso ako. Tumatahul ka. Pakiramdam mo, aso ka. Kaya nung pa ba nagsimula yan? Look, nung tutapa ako eh. <laughs> Ibig sabihin nun, may history na. You know? So sometimes in looking for the cause, you have to also look at the history. No? Di ba? Kailangan, tingnan mo yung history. Anyway, so this is, this is the diagnostic model. Now, the paradigm or the metaphor behind it is that the organization is a machine. That is the way we look at organization without knowing it. So that like a machine, like the computer or your cell phone or the watch or whatever, in a machine, if there is something that is broken, then you just fix it. And many people look at organizations that way. That is why they develop this methodology of problem solving. You look at the organization, you segregate, you know, the problem areas, and then you put it, them back. And that's the way you work with organization. This is problem solving. And we are so used to it. You know, even if you did not take this in college, you are used to it. Because at an early age, they already teach you how to do problem solving. Now, in appreciative inquiry, we are looking at organizations from a different perspective. And the paradigm is different. By the way, the word appreciative inquiry comes from two words. The first one is to appreciate. 
To appreciate means to see something positive in something. Okay? Or in someone. In this case, to, to see something positive in an organization. To see the strengths of an organization. Our reason is because we want to enhance what is already good, what is already existing in an organization. If you are looking for problems, you don't want to enhance problems. Because otherwise, you will have more problems. But in appreciative inquiry, you know, you are building on what is already there, what is already existing. So you ask yourself, how can I enhance this? How can I make it even better? But, you know, this is going ahead of, of the methodology. Anyway, and then the second uh, word here is inquiry. Inquiry is to question. That is why in appreciative inquiry, we just ask questions. Because questions are very powerful. You know, when you start thinking of questions, you know, you will get into solutions that your mind perhaps has not even imagined. That is why uh, questions are one of the most powerful things in the world. So, the first thing in appreciative inquiry is to value what is, to value what is there, what gives life. The presumption here is that in an organization, even in the most troubled, the most, uh, uh, what do you call this, a problematic organizations, the mere fact that they are still standing as organization means there are more things going on that are right rather than problems. Okay? Nothing in this world is perfect. Marriages are not perfect. I'm sure if you talk to your, if I talk to your spouses, they will tell me, you know, what they don't like about you. You know? And you yourself will also tell me what you don't like about your husband or your wife. No marriage is perfect. But the mere fact that you are still together, it means there are more things going on in your life that are sustaining the, the marriage rather than things that will make them fall apart. And in appreciative inquiry, what we are trying to do is to enhance those that are already life-giving instead of looking at the problems and trying to solve them. And I will tell you later why it doesn't work to solve the problems. Okay? So, so you value what is. We will get into these steps later on. Second, we envision what might be. So what is very good about this uh, planning methodology is you get to talk about your dreams. You get to talk about what you want in the future, your aspirations. And for you, you know, when you use this to, to do strategic planning with your catechists, you will ask them, you know, what is your dream for the future? How can we enhance the service that we are already doing here? Like brother said, you know, you were not placed there accidentally. In the mind of God, since the beginning of time, God has already wanted you to become the leaders of catechists. This is a noble task. Okay? So, you know, I graduated from Don Bosco and I almost became one of them. Only but uncle was with the Vincentia, so he pulled me there. But anyway, you know, uh, I don't regret it. I don't regret it. But, you know, having been with the Don Bosco, I appreciate the way also that uh, they have been bringing up the young people. And in some way, you know, there is something there about Don Bosco who saw in each child, okay, the child of God and a flower, you know, that needs to blossom. It's a very positive system. It's a very positive system. And I'm sure St. John Baptist de La Salle, you know, I have not uh, read his writings, but I'm sure he had also that mind. Okay? So, you, you ask your catechists, what are our aspirations for the future? 
what do we want to build here in, in our diocese? Then the third is the dialogue. What should be? You know, after you do the dreams, you ask yourselves, now how can we put this into practice? What kind of structures, what kind of processes, you know, what kind of actions, of activities in order to put into practice the dreams that we have? And in some cases, you might even have to make a vision and a mission statement. Because, you know, if you have a very powerful vision and mission statement, it will compel people. You know? A very powerful mission vision statement will create the future. Because it is like a, a, a magnet that attracts the energy of people. Okay? So, then, uh, innovating what will be. This is really laying down the groundwork. This is where we go into how do we do it now. So these are the four steps. And as you can see, they are contrary to the first uh, diagnostic model that I showed you. So what is the model here? The model here is the organization as a network of social relationships. This is what we call social constructionism. So the philosophy behind this is what we call social constructionism. Social constructionism, in simple terms, says that reality is not given. Reality is constructed by people. Reality is socially constructed when people come together when they have consensus about a particular thing. Again, going into, very, uh, uh, into a very simple example, <laughs> All of you here, I'm sure, know that when you see this set of lights, red, green, and yellow, what are they? Signal lights, stop lights, as we say. Green stands for? Go. Go. Red? Stop. 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 Yellow? Oh, you know, some people say, run. <laughs> Some people say wait, you know, so again it depends. But anyway, if you bring these three sets of lights to a baby, do you think the baby knows what they are? No. But why is it that all of us, all over the world, you know, recognize these three lights and say that is stop, that is uh, go, that is wait? Why, why, why are we saying that about these three sets of lights? Who told us? Is there any decree coming from the Pope or from whoever saying all these three lights should be like this? I don't think so. But most probably in one part of the world, one convention perhaps, people determine by consensus that from now on these are signal lights, and this is what they mean. Correct? That is the meaning of a socially constructed reality. It is not really there, but people constructed it. Now, from the perspective of appreciative inquiry, all organizations are socially constructed. Again, I'll give you an example. Can you shake hands with De La Salle University? <laughs> no. You can shake hands with a De La Salle student, but De La Salle University? No. No, you cannot. With a student, but not with a university. Because the university is only a relationship of faculty members, students, administrators. That is why, you know, sometimes, you know, when we sign contracts, people say, you don't have any legal entity. No? Do you realize that? You don't have any legal entity because you are not registered with the SEC. Does it mean to say your organization is not existing? It is, but, you know, you are not recognized. 
what we are saying here is organizations are the fruit of social relationships. An organization comes to be when people have a particular purpose, like here in De La Salle University, to educate people. That is their particular purpose. So all of them are in a social relationship where all of them help one another to reach the goal, which is the education of students. That is the social construction of reality. And in social construction of reality, the most important thing to remember is words. Because words and language is what we use to construct reality. Another example. In some walls, I see the words, no smoking. In other buildings, I see, thank you for not smoking. Is there a difference? Yes. Right? The end result is they don't want you to smoke. But if you say, thank you for not smoking, then, you know, you arrival, you dating, you know? Is different rather than say no smoking or you know when I was in Cleveland one of the students you know who was very upset that some of our classmates were smoking inside the class he said oh, he, he wrote a poster that said uh, no smoking in this room smokers will be shot <laughs> Then below that, if they survive, they will be shot again. <laughs> so, you know, that sends a very powerful message. That sends a power, very powerful message. So words are important. In fact, I remember here St. James telling us the tongue is a very small uh, part of your body, but the damage that it can do, you know, is immeasurable. But the opposite is also true. The tongue is very small, but when you use it to affirm people, to appreciate them, you know, the effect is immeasurable. Now think of the times that your sisters, other people came to you, you listened to them, you consoled them, you uttered some words of advice, and after that they left. And it made a huge difference in their life. So this is the meaning of words and language. And in social construction of reality, this is who, this is what we use, language. So what is the purpose of language? This author said, as I considered the importance of language and how human beings interact with the world, it struck me that in many ways, the development of language was like the discovery of fire. It was such an incredible primordial force. I had always thought that we use language to describe the world. Now, I was seeing that this is not the case. To the contrary, it is through language that we create the world because it's nothing until we describe it. And when we describe it, we see distinctions that govern our actions. To put it in another way, we do not describe the world we see, but we see the world we describe. In other words, through language, we can create the world. Some years ago, I was reading the column of Father Jerry Orbos. Sunday, I think it's a Philippine Daily Inquirer. And he was uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, I, I think he was in a tricycle with some kids. And then in front of them was another tricycle where they were bringing some pigs to be slaughtered. Okay? And, of course, for Father Jerry, kawawa naman itong mga baboy na ito. Because they will die. You know, it's a matter of minutes or hours, they will be slaughtered. But for the children who were with him, one of them said, 
Hindi. Sabi niya, ang bait naman ng may-ari ng ano, tinuturpa niya yung mga pig. <laughs> He looked at reality in a different way. You know? And when you look at reality in a different way, something changes. You are thinking outside of the box. And I think, sisters and brothers, this is what we need today. To look at reality in a different way. Because when you look at reality in a different way, something changes. Something that you have never even thought before. Many of the things that we have now, you know, have been the results of perhaps even problem solving. But they look at things in a different way. Now, you know, uh, taxis are a dying race. We have Grab, we have Hirna, we have, ano pa? You know? Wala no Uber dito, but in, in other places. But they have revolutionized, actually. They have revolutionized uh, our transportation industry. Amazon has revolutionized the way of ordering books. In the beginning, it was only books. Now you can buy anything, and they will deliver you. Uh, they will deliver it to you at your doorstep. You don't even need to worry about it. You know? In some countries, there are less and less stores and more and more online stores because people are just going online. They don't even need to visit the store. And so some stores may run out of business after some time. In many libraries today, when I was in Adamson, you know, uh, the accreditors told us that we should have a certain number, certain percentage of e-books rather than the books that are there in the shelves. And after five years, you have to pull them out, otherwise you get a demerit. In e-books, you know, they are very expensive. And so, in our library today, if you go to Adamson, there are a lot of computers. You might think it's a computer shop because a lot of students now go to e-books rather than, you know, read uh, the physical books. So this is another revolution that is happening. Okay? Online courses, you know, where one professor is teaching here and then several students in different countries are listening to the same professor at the same time. Okay? Real time. Real time. Some of our professors attend classes at DePaul University through Skype. Real time. Although here in the Philippines when they go to class, it's early in the morning. But they have to do that sacrifice in order to get their degrees. So, these are the things that are happening in order to show us, you know, that things are not the way they should be. So this is what language is all about. This is from jo uh, Joseph Jaworski. Now, still, when I talk to people about the uh, appreciative inquiry, the persistent question is, why is it, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, appreciative inquiry, does it mean to say that we will not look at problems anymore? Okay, and I tell them, well, you know, that's not the case. So people ask me always, how do I deal with problems in an organization? Because when they, for example, invite me to go to an organization to do strategic uh, planning with them, or to do an organizational intervention, or OD, organizational development, usually the presenting uh, problem is what they discuss. You know, we have very low morale of our employees. They are not motivated. They, there is a lot of absenteeism. There are cliques within the group. People are always asking for higher and higher salaries, etc. So we, as organizational uh, development uh, or behavior consultants, we sit down and then we talk to them. 
So the question here is, what about problems? Do we ignore them? Do we set them aside? Do we hide them? Do we reject them? No, actually we don't do that. In appreciative inquiry, we acknowledge problems, but we don't focus on them. We acknowledge them, but we don't focus on them. Because what you focus on becomes your reality. Okay? If you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail. Do you realize that? If you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail. So, if you focus on a problem, everything will be a problem. You will unearth more and more problems. Now, if problem solving is truly effective, and it has been with us for more than 500, for 400 years, okay? If it is truly effective, then we should have solved all the problems of the world. However, perhaps you realize that we have not solved all the problems of the world. And don't ever think you will solve the problems of the world. One of the things that, you know, I put in my head when I started as the president of, of Adamson and I stayed there for 16 years, 12 of which I was the president, you know. When I had problems, I always told myself, I'm in the right place. I should expect problems. Because if you don't expect problems and you say, ang dami problema rito, may stress out ka. Diba? But if you expect that there could be problems, then you just accept them and you move on. Because problems will be there. And I also told myself, after I leave this university, there will be still problems. So the next one is still having problems. So my prediction is correct. No? And even the next one will have problems. Because problems will always be there. That is the reason why we should not focus on problems. Because you cannot solve all of them. You have to put your energy somewhere else. So how do you deal with problems? First, you have to realize that problems are mental constructs. They are created by your mind. Look at children, they don't have problems. You know, their mental constructs are different. And sometimes when they talk to you, you say, in the mind of children, it is possible. But for you, it's not. Because they have a different mental framework. And that is why, in the first step of appreciative inquiry, you become all inspired by what you see in an organization. When you enter an organization, you say, Nako, mga katikis dito. Pareho ito nung iniwanan ko nun ah. Mas marami pa. No? No. If you enter with that attitude, what will happen? You know, you get cranky at once. But if you are, if you enter that organization and you have some experience of all, and say, you know, these are people that God has sent me to minister to and to serve. What do I find here that I can build on? It's different. You don't look at them as a problem. You look at them actually not as solutions, but as opportunities. Remember the SWOT analysis? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And they tell you that the the weaknesses you have to turn into opportunities or into strengths and the threats you have to turn into opportunities in appreciative inquiry we don't use SWOT analysis for the simple reason that in SWOT analysis very often you only stay with the problems you don't actually generate solutions 
In SWOT analysis, you don't you don't uh, focus on the strengths. You only focus on the weaknesses. That is why, you know, if you want to progress, to bring the organization to another level, SWOT analysis is a very poor methodology. So we don't use it. Rather, we we use the appreciative method, which is what is already here and what can I do in order to enhance it? You don't enhance something that is absent. You know, you enhance what is already present. So, you don't solve problems, you only outgrow them. And here is a quotation from Carl Jung. Okay, in the handout, you will find this quotation. All the greatest and most important problems of life are fundamentally insoluble. They can never be solved, but only outgrown. This outgrowing proves on further investigation to require a new level of consciousness. Some higher or wider interest appeared on the horizon, and through this broadening of outlook, the insoluble problem lost its urgency. It was not solved logically in its own terms, but faded when confronted with a new and stronger light urge. And so in our growing process, we don't really solve all our issues. You know, and I tell this to our formators. I have had some sessions with formators because I was a formator myself. You know, you don't solve the problems of your, of your formandi because otherwise, you know, all of them will get out. Nobody is issue free. You realize that? So what do you do? You only make them realize their issues so that they don't act on them. Not to suppress them, but to befriend them so they don't act on them. But the issue is still there. It was not solved. Let me give you an example. You know, I think my mother who passed away last year is a genius. I don't know how she discovered that I'm afraid of darkness. You know, we didn't have a dialogue, no analysis, no psychological test. But she discovered when I was very young that I was afraid of darkness. So whenever I was misbehaving, she would tell me, Papasok kita dyan. May multo dyan. May mama. You know? There is a ghost there inside that dark room. And so, she opens the door and I start crying and running away. You know? So, from a very young age, I was traumatized. And I always had the fear of darkness. Friends, until now, I'm still afraid of darkness. <laughs> Sometimes, if it is dark, when I was there in San Marcelino, you know, we have this huge church. And I would go at night, and I'm looking. You know, and I tell the sacristans, put on the lights. You know, sometimes I wish them in the dark when I go to the crypt. And I'm already a priest. And until now, I still feel darkness. But I still feel the fear of darkness. It has not left me. But I'm able to deal with it. And I just discovered that if you are afraid of darkness, you can be a president of Alonso. <laughs> <laughs> or even a provincial of the Vincent. <laughs> because when they asked me, when they elected me, they, it was not one of the qualifications. Are you afraid of darkness? And it was not even asked. So, what I mean to say here is that we have our own issues, our own problems. Okay? You don't solve them. You just outgrow them. And this outgrowing, Carl Jung says, is to focus on something that will, that will draw your energy. And once you focus on it, the other things fade to comparison. There are still problems, but the urgency is already lost. Many of the great people that we have, many of the great times, except perhaps the saints, you know, they had their own weaknesses. They had their own weaknesses. But nobody talks about them. You know, nobody talks about them. Because what they talk is they 
heroism of this man, the sanctity of this man, and all of that. So this is a case of outgrowing the problems. In this sense, in an organization, you tend to outgrow the problems. The problems will still be there. You don't solve them. But the urgency is not there anymore. You can move forward because your people are actually going in a direction that they want. Okay? Another dimension. The source of problems is a framework. Go to the framework first because you might have to change it. If you change the framework, you know, then it's not a problem. They say you cannot pull, put a round peg in a square hole. That's fine. That's true. So change the hole. Make it round. Diba? Or change the peg and make it square. What's the problem? So it's up to you. So you have to go to the framework because that might be the problem. The world we have made as a result of the level of thinking we have done thus far creates problems we cannot solve at the same level of thinking at which we created them. This is actually telling us that we cannot solve problems as we see them. Very often the problems are beneath the solutions, by the way, are beneath, okay, not in the same level. Let me give you an example. When I became the president of Adamson, on, on the first year, I remember there was a kind of protest from the uh, parents of the first year students. Why is it that our children are asked to go to school on Saturdays? The whole of Saturday. Okay? And what was that for? In the morning, it was math zero, and in the afternoon, English class. They have to pay fees, and all the first years have to go. So, you know, because the parents protested and they had a formal letter, I met the deans and the other faculty members, and we discussed it. I said, I don't know what is this. So, what are they saying? Father, because on Sundays or Saturdays, these uh, students who come to us, most of them are from public schools. Their math is very poor. And we are an engineering school. Okay, so they are complaining. The teachers are complaining. So we have to give them supplementary courses in math. And in English, it's the same. It's the same. And so they were discussing it. They were discussing it. Should we remove it or not, etc. <coughs> Until one of the professors said, Father, you know, we are not going to the source of the problem. And I said, what is the source of the problem? The source of the problem is in the, in the high school, elementary and high school, the math foundation of students is very poor especially public school students. This was one of the reasons also why this motivated us. And I was the president of CEAP at that time, and Brother Armin Mistro was the president of the La Salle, and eventually the Deaf Ed uh, Secretary, that actually pushed us to add two more years, grades 11 and 12. Because even if we say our students are very intelligent, you know, because when they go abroad, you know, they excel, still, you know, most of our students are very poor in math and English and science, etc. So that teacher actually identified the root of the problem. Father, it is not with us, it is in the Philippine system of education. So she said, no matter how much we try to supplement, we are not really making a difference. So if you listen to me, he said, take them out of here, give them more free time, and that would be better for them. 
<coughs> so eventually, we removed classes on Saturdays. We added some units in math, especially in the elementary and high school. But we knew that many of them may not go to Adamson, but go somewhere else. But it's okay. I said, this is for the future of education. So this is what Einstein is telling us. We have to go deeper and look for the problem. But for some people who uh, use appreciative inquiry, you can also say that it is a system or it is a method of problem solving. And I will read to you this quotation from uh, Thomas White, who was the CEO of GTE Telephone Company in the US. You will be given this. I think you have a copy of that. Appreciative inquiry, a tool for problem solving. With this, we finish the first part, then we will all go for lunch. Okay, so let's uh, distribute that.